Hey Rock Church, we're so glad that you're joining us tonight for Red Words. We are going to dive in again to more of what Jesus says in the Bible. We are thankful that Dr. Craig Keener is with us again tonight. If you missed Sunday service, be sure to go back and watch it. We have heard from so many people on what a blessing it was to hear from someone so knowledgeable and wise on the New Testament as to what Jesus actually said about such a difficult topic like divorce. So tonight you get to witness our Q&A session with Dr. Keener, um, Pastor Matt and Jason and myself were able to sit and actually interact with Dr. Keener. So you're gonna hear some of those questions and some of those answers from him. And one of the things that I wanted to encourage you, you know, you might not be divorced, your parents might not be divorced, but that doesn't mean it's something that you shouldn't hear because everybody knows people that have gone through difficult things and as Christians, we're to minister to them. So it's so important to use this as a tool. So whether what you hear tonight is for you right now in this season or for a past season, I know that God can use it as a tool for you to minister to others. So let's all turn on our listening ears. Let's get ready to learn. Jesus said these words and we need to know what he meant and how we can minister to others. So take a listen. So you were gonna ask some questions. Yes. Uh, I don't know the answer if it's not in the text. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Matt, did you have a couple questions that you wanted to ask? Sure, yeah. So so pretty much you answered most of mine in your talk, which is awesome. But um, I would say if, if someone is considering divorce, what should they do to determine if their reason is biblically justified? Because <clears throat> I think through a lot of teaching um, in the church today of just what what Jesus said about divorce, saying like it's only in the grounds of sexual immorality, you know, um, that that people feel, especially if they're in a, an abusive situation, they they feel kind of like, well, I, I I would love to get out and escape this and not be a you know a punching bag kind of thing, but I feel like the Bible constrains me. Um, and then on the other side of things, now that you've brought up this idea of hyperbole and the fact that Paul does in a pastoral uh, kind of way gives another qualifier. You know, it could also be easy to, for people to say like, okay, well, well, then there are more reasons. So how do I determine whether the reason that, that so, somebody is considering is actually biblical or not? Um, how would you go about that? Well, the basic, the basic rule of thumb is keep your marriage together insofar as it depends on you. You can't control what your spouse is doing. If your spouse is breaking up the marriage, I mean, and, and not just because they, because um, let, let me take a, just a, a weird example from our marriage. My, my wife and I, we get along great, but there's some things we disagree about. So like um, uh, she, she doesn't like it when I'm eating in the kitchen and I stand, but not when but you know, I'll stand up to eat because I sit in front of the computer a lot of the day. So, you know, if somebody says, well, that's grounds for divorce, my spouse won't quit standing. Uh, and and uh, it, it, I'll take another example from early in our marriage where um, my, my wife is from Congo, Brazzaville in Africa. And I would say, je t'aime, I love you. It, it, uh, her country is French speaking. And she would, she would say, merci, thank you. I, I was I was expecting she was going to say uh, je t'aime moi aussi I love you too. So I would go away sad, and she couldn't figure out why does he go away sad when I thank him for for saying I love you. And we didn't find out till later from another intercultural couple um, that was that's just the African uh, at least her part of Africa, a lot of parts of Africa. When we tell this in Africa, people laugh because uh, they they laugh. But because I was expecting the wrong thing, when I tell it here, or we tell it here, people laugh because like, oh, yeah, why is she saying that? Uh, so it, it was just a cultural difference. You know, there the expectation was responding with, with uh, gratitude. Here the expectation is responding with reciprocity. It never, it never occurred to us that that could be a cultural difference. You know, we grew up in different homes and stuff like that. So 
don't give up on the marriage because of you know something that ultimately can be resolved through communication or things you don't even know to communicate about. Um, there, there, there are ways to address those things. There's counseling, there's um, just hanging out together and learning one another's stories and things like that. But, um, but if, it's, if the other person is breaking the marriage by being unfaithful to it, well, there, there's more than one way to be unfaithful to it. I mean, if they are being sexually unfaithful, if they just walk out, <laughs> that's unfaithful. And if if they're if they're mistreating you, not not like again, just you're disagreeing over the thermostat or something like that, they're mistreating you, abusing you, uh, physical abuse. I think that is a, a grounds for. Um, it's certainly a grounds for getting out of there. Uh, in Matthew ten twenty three. When they persecute you in one city, flee to another. I mean, that's persecution for the name of Christ. Often in abusive situations, the person will say, I'm sorry, but they haven't changed. So, you know, Joseph, yeah, he would he forgave his brothers, but he didn't reveal himself to them right away. He had to, he had to see they were willing to stand up for Benjamin. He had to see they weren't like when they sold him into slavery. It's not always smart to trust somebody right off the bat, even if you forgive them. So uh, if, if there isn't change, then, I mean, divorce is gonna have to be the option, but um, don't, don't stay in the situation, don't endanger yourself. So in, in some ways I'd probably sound too strict, some ways I'd probably sound too lenient, depending on who's listening, but basic rule of thumb is try, to have a good marriage, but you're not responsible for what the other person does. You're only responsible for what you do. God knows your heart. I love what you're saying, Craig, and I would say that um, Pastor Rick would agree with you. You know, it's that passion, that heart to seek God's heart, and that He has a higher expectation of marriage than what we've kind of yeah. turned it into. And that he, I would say, he would say, try, you try, you try, you try, you try. But, you know, like what you were saying, too, it does become a point where there's decisions that have to be made and you seek God's counsel. You know, you go to God and, and talk to him about it. But um, I know one question that Rick would have and that he said, I just want to know, is divorce a sin? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, divorce is a sin. But the sin is breaking the marriage. So, like in the uh, during the slavery era in the U.S., if if a slaveholder breaks up a, a marriage, and maybe it wasn't a marriage under U.S. law because they weren't allowed to in some cases, but if a slaveholder breaks up a marriage, the divorce is a sin, but it's not the sin of, of either of the slaves. It's it's the slaveholder who's responsible for that, and if if a husband is is beating his wife, or if a wife is beating her husband, that's not uh, that's not the the fault of the person who's being beaten. It's common to internalize that. I mean, as the person who is being abused, it's common to uh, feel like, "What did I do wrong?" But um, God is near the lowly and the broken. He's on the side of the oppressed. He's not on the side of the oppressor. Um, so, yeah, God, uh, yeah, somebody is responsible for breaking up a marriage. There's always somebody. Well, I mean, well, I guess I could imagine something where um, somebody went off to war and they're declared dead and then the person remarries and then you know the person turns out to be alive years later and comes back okay that's not anybody's fault there but i mean under almost all circumstances that we can imagine at least one person has committed the sin but it doesn't mean that both people have committed a sin and if we have sinned that's why we turn to god we we repent but we also 
we also need to try to make things right with the person or the people against whom we sinned. So, um, but yeah, there's forgiveness. How best is it to respond to people who take a more conservative approach to the scriptures when they when it says like, uh, if you've divorced and you remarried, you're committing adultery, you know, and you're, are you living in perpetual sin then kind of can, or, but it doesn't make sense to then divorce that person because then you've created another <laughs> sin, you know, and, and then you look at like, look at what David did and he had just had Uriah killed and then he wasn't living in sin anymore, you know, but, but people who read in, you know, very <laughs> yeah. conservative uh, readings of the Bible, like sin or divorce is only if, you know, it's adultery. Oh, kill the former spouse. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> no, then it's, it's, then it's not perpetual that. sin, right? At least I've just got the one sin to deal with, you know, kind of thing. But yeah, yeah so curious. This, this would be, well, a couple things. One with sometimes people who don't recognize hyperbole in Jesus' teaching. I mean, it's a legitimate debate which things are hyperbole and which things are, are stated literally as such, that's a legitimate debate. But if somebody doesn't recognize hyperbole in Jesus' teachings, all I can say to them is, go read the gospels and keep reading them until you, <laughs> I mean, how can you, you're, you're, you get dogmatic on, on one verse or two verses or three verses, but you haven't bothered to immerse yourself in Jesus' teachings. Now, as to, how we treat the person who does that, that's not a matter of just, just these divorce texts. That's a matter of, again, loving your neighbors yourself and loving your brother and sister and laying down your life for them. I mean, not to the point of, you know, they say, okay, well, it's a stumbling block to me. Well, keep your nose in your own business and it won't be. But we, 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 we're not deliberately trying to uh, hurt them. We do, you know, we want to love them. Now, if you're still feeling the sting of divorce, you may not be the one to minister to those people, you know, um, but as, as a church, as believers, okay, these are our brothers and sisters. Well, most of them are our brothers and sisters. And so we want to love them, especially if they're doing what they think is right. I mean, I remember the church, when I was first converted from atheism, like over 40 years ago, became a Christian, the church that I was in, there were people there who were in abusive marriages or things like that. And I don't think the church taught that. I, I think they the church would have let them get a divorce, but they, you know, out of their, they wouldn't do it. And um, one case, it actually turned out the guy on his deathbed did become a believer, uh, but he'd been beating his wife for all these years. And I mean, she may have been able to lead him to Christ or somebody may have been able to lead him to Christ without that. But in any case, there was another, I say that too often in any case, but it's a way of transitioning. There was another woman there. She was waiting faithfully for her husband to come back. He had, he had left her, he was doing drugs, he was selling drugs, he came back, but he was still selling drugs. And he started selling drugs to their children. And she was like, oh no, you know, out of the frying pan and into the fire. I just, I don't even know what to say to something like that. I mean, God bless her. She, she thought she was doing the right thing. God will bless her and honor her for doing that. But that didn't turn out well. And it wasn't something, it wasn't a situation that God was required to bless because it was based on misunderstanding. When people have misunderstandings or misappropriations of scripture, it can have serious consequences. We've got a lot of hurt and broken people. A lot of people have left the church and, and maybe they still love Jesus, but you know they feel shame, they feel rejected. They may feel like God rejects them because they've sinned and maybe they haven't sinned. It's been wrong teaching that's been given to them. So we need to give right teaching and we need to give it gently and lovingly. 
just to follow up with that though, for people who maybe they did have a an unbiblical divorce mm-hmm. and they remarried and they're feeling like, uh, you know, I may be living in perpetual sin. And, and you see it all the time. We get asked that question a lot because in the area we're at, California is a lot of, a lot of divorces and, and a lot of remarriages. And so that was true in Corinth too, by the way. <laughs> so how, how do you alleviate their concerns uh, about that, about having an unbiblical divorce and then, you know, being divorced now or being remarried now? Yeah. That's why the interpretation of the passage, these passages is so important because <sighs> And, and I've had people ask me the same thing. And uh, places where one, one guy, he was suffering because, you know, they had, they had been in that situation. The wife concluded, okay, we can't sleep together anymore. So they were sleeping in separate rooms. Um, and just the wrong teaching has consequences in people's lives. Jesus' point is be faithful to your marriage. And if we're to follow Jesus' point, okay, these people are remarried, be faithful to this marriage. Normally when a person's divorced, this is not a Bible thing, this is something I've learned from counselors who shared this with me because we were at conferences talking about divorce and I was giving the biblical stuff. But normally if somebody's divorced, even the innocent party, if they remarry too quickly, they carry all that emotional baggage in with them. Um, But once you're in a new marriage, again, assuming it's not the person's running around on you and and, all these things we talked about before, once you're in a new marriage, Jesus wants you to be faithful to that marriage, to make that marriage flourish, to make it work. That's one of the main reasons I talk about the hyperbole. I mean, for one thing, it's for the innocent party, but also so we don't break up second and third marriages and hopefully not fourth and fifth. Well, we have the Samaritan woman. I think even just with you talking, Craig, it's so helpful and I think healing to um, one, those that have gone through it, you know, and understanding that sometimes we can misread scripture or or not take it into the context that it was delivered. And I think from some of what we've talked about before, too, is even um, Jesus's heart is for healthy, good marriages, you know, sin, the sin being brought into the world is what has caused this disruption, the hardening of heart and all of that. And even raising the bar, like I think one of the concerns and Matt and I were talking about this beforehand, is that we've almost created this thing in the in the church because of misreading scripture, that is allowing spouses to treat their spouse however they want, because, oh, you're a Christian, you can't divorce me. And it's and it's enabling this Um, just unhealth, which Jesus never, like, that's not what he would convey. Like he conveys, no, I expect higher. Paul says, you know, you love your wife, your spouse, like Christ loves the church or your husband should do that. You know, so the bar is higher, but it's weird how this scripture harvesting of pulling a few, I feel has left some people imprisoned to taking abuse yep. and like the ones that the references that you made and that I think that saddens me I think as a, yeah. as pastors like we're just trying to find ways to minister to those that are doing well you know mm-hmm. and have healthy wonderful marriages or li- living up to that standard yeah. those that have been broken through it and those and new ones trying to help them you know do the same so your words have been so encouraging today I really appreciate it um and I do have to say, because you brought up your wife, <laughs> and I have to tell the Rock Church that that their story is amazing. I've read Impossible Love is the name of the book, right? Yeah, I loved it. I read it, and I've recommended it multiple times. What a what an amazing testimony of God's hand on both of you. I just, uh, your wife is just a hero to me, and the, the reading her, the stuff that she went through in the Congo and stuff was just amazing God's miraculous hand on her. So just love that story. So if anyone wants to read a book and, and find out like about his story and his wife's story, it's just amazing. It's beautiful. She's wonderful. Uh, now Ephesians 5 that you referenced, that's another one that gets taken, out, you know, one verse out of context that is used in ways And wherever people are, I think on the theological spectrum, I think most of us would agree that it gets used in ways that are abusive in marriages. Um, But 
Yeah, but the other thing you said about God's heart, I mean, that's that gives us a broader context. We read scripture, not just to take isolated verses with a lot of blank space in between. We read scripture to get to know God, to get to know his heart. And if we see Jesus' heart, I mean, he's always standing up for people. He's always loving people. He's calling us to do the same thing. And, you know, people can take this principle out of context and use that to say anything too. But when we internalize it in our hearts, um, the way God's heart calls us to uh, treat people. Jesus was dealing with some teachers in Matthew 19 who, because of the hardness of their heart, were hurting innocent parties. We need to make sure that we don't use scripture to do the same thing. Yeah. Agreed. Well, thank you, Craig. That was amazing. We're so grateful. Uh, I did hear my husband was listening to a podcast today. So because you were saying saturate yourself in God's word. Oh. He, he heard a rumor that you actually re would read 40 chapters a day. So you would make it through the New Testament every week and then the whole Bible every month. Well, one or the other. I, I couldn't do the New Testament every week and the whole Bible every month with 40 chapters a day. But yeah, no, no, that, that, I didn't. I don't always do that. I and mean, that was that was a certain period as I was trying to familiarize myself with the text and, and learn the context. I love that as just an example of saturating yourself in his word, you know, that you really spent the time saturating yourself in the word and it shows. So thank you. <laughs> and that and that was that was. Um, yeah, I was working a full-time job part of the time when I was doing that, 40 hours a week. Didn't leave me time to do anything else. Yeah. But, <laughs> yeah. um, there was no TV in your, in your schedule. <laughs> oh, no, 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 I still don't. Yeah, I mean, what, one, once a week, my wife and I may watch a Bible movie or something, or, uh, well, she, she, she watches some, some edifying things. I, I, or, or when I'm indexing, I may, I may listen to a church history thing, but yeah, I, I, I want to immerse myself in God's word and God's heart. And I know people have different callings. If you're a television producer, you're gonna to have to watch stuff, obviously. <laughs> but um, yeah, for me, I'm a Bible scholar. I'm called to teach the Bible. So I get to, I get to enjoy immersing myself in God's word. Oh, it's wonderful. <laughs> it shows and you're a blessing for it. So thank you, Craig. Thank you. Awesome. So, um, do you want to pray, Matt? I think we should yeah. close in prayer. I think it'd Let's be wonderful. It. Father, we love you. We thank you so much uh, for Craig coming on with us yes. and just helping us um, really open the scriptures uh, in, a, in an accurate way, Lord, rightly dividing the word of truth like you call us to do. I thank you for his life, Lord. And I pray that in this, in this next season as a church that you would just give us that clarity and that hunger that uh, Craig has for the word, that we would have that same hunger, Lord, to look at the word in context for what it really meant to the original audience, but then applying it to our lives in a helpful way, Lord. Uh, and for those struggling with this topic of, of divorce, or maybe they're, they're having struggles in their marriage, I pray that you, Lord, would send your comforter yes. to their marriage. The Holy Spirit would just come and uh, alongside them and help them, and let there be uh, miracles in marriages in this next yes. season of healing of marriages, healing of relationships. Yes. We love you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thanks, Matt. Well, Rock Church, I hope you got as much out of that as we did. We just love Dr. Keener. We want to thank him again for joining us. And brace yourself because that was one topic, but he also knows a ton about miracles. He's written two volumes of um, documented miracles from from the first century until now. So we actually have more footage that we're gonna be showing in September and October as we continue to dive into Red Words. And let me tell you, it will blow your mind. It's amazing. So we're so glad that you joined us tonight. We look forward to seeing you guys soon.